Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 30th, 2014. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week you're going to see that I really, really mean. We've got a lot to cover, a lot to cover. So I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement, but um, Pepsco, if you're out there, I'll be happy to uh, accept your endorsement. Oh, good stuff. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. It's pretty easy to sum up. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. In fact, we've been seeing a lot of stuff lately happening. Hey, do me a favor. If you read the book, like the book. Otherwise, I'm not sure why you'd be here, but um, throw me a bone on Amazon. Put me up a good review if you don't mind. Um, yes, I come out and ask for a review. If you like it, then put me a review. People email me all the time. Hey, Dave, love the book. Put me a review. <laughs> One reason I ask is that um, there's a couple of stinker reviews up there that have nothing to do with the book itself, so I like to see everything balance itself out. All right. What are we going to talk about? Well, I want you to start thinking about something, and we're going to revisit this in a few minutes. I want to know why does a stock exist? And this is from your perspective, okay? Not from a company's perspective. Why does a stock exist? Don't answer me yet. Start thinking about that. Um, I want to talk a look, little bit about ebb and flow, letting the market adjust your portfolio. Uh, I think it's important that we spend a little time talking about transitions, specifically the bow ties. And we're going to talk about those at the indices, and then we'll get to the individual sectors. We'll spend a little time on that. And then, obviously, thoughts on any of your subjects start thinking now. Um, and we already have a few questions stacking up. That's fine. I'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, a couple of ground rules, if you don't mind. Um, during the slides, let's keep the questions um, on the slides or on trading, I should say. So I guess I should uh, scratch this out. Okay. And then when we get to the live charts, then you can start asking about individual stocks. If you don't mind, just ask about them one at a time. So X, Y, Z, and then hit return and A, B, C, and then hit return. So I can come in and X these out after we talk about them. Otherwise, if you put X, Y, Z, A, B, C, uh, E, F, G, whatever, I'll cover maybe this one, and then I'll forget to cover these, or it's hard for me to figure out which ones have been covered. So that's about it. Ideally, the stock should be trending. I don't know if Don's here, but uh, ideally you want the stock to be trending, Don. Uh, let's talk about portfolio ebb and flow. I actually took this picture myself. This is the Great Ocean Road uh, down in Australia, not far from Melbourne, or how do they say it down there? Melbourne. Um, beautiful ride if you get a chance to do it. I didn't notice flow was in the picture when I took it, though. Uh, but anyway, this is the uh, 12 apostles down the Great Ocean Road. I'm not sure if, how many apostles are left with all the erosions, but a uh, really neat place. And the reason I want to talk about ebb and flow is it's important, We talk as we talked about last week, to take partial profits as offered. I just want to kind of rehash that a little bit. As you know, we sort of build on things from weeks prior. But you never really know if you're at the end of a trend, if that trade is only going to be a swing trade, or if it's, a, if it's going to turn into something much greater. As I often say, we get the choppy market. We have uh, a half a dozen trades go up, hit the profit target, come back in, stop out. Everybody says, Dave, why didn't we take 100% of the profit target? And then we have a trending market where we have a half a dozen trades go up, hit the profit target, and keep on going. Everyone says, Dave, why do we take partial profits? And the answer is because you never know. You never know what the market is going to give you. So it sort of allows you to have your cake and eat it to it. And also, if you guys have watched the last few webinars, you know that I talked a lot about this microwave society that we live in where we want this instant gratification. We can't wait for our – we can't drive to the store and pick up a movie anymore. That's why Blockbuster no longer exists. 
that that takes too much time. It's too much hurry, too much stress. It's much easier just to download that movie to our smart TV or have uh, Netflix online. Okay, so we no longer want to wait for things, but the market doesn't always work in our time frame. The good news is sometimes with this swing trading, swing to intermediate term trading, and it's kind of like a, I guess a double entendre there. Now you're trying to swing to intermediate trading. Okay, you capture that short term profit, which which fulfills your short term need for fulfillment. I don't know if that's Maslow's need or what, but we live in this microwave society. We want those instant results. And sometimes that gives you that, that instant need for gratification. And then I think further up that ladder or hierarchy, we have this need to be right and to be right in a big way. And that's where the staying with the longer term trend and capturing that longer term winner, that little solar stock that goes up several hundred percent or a little biotech that goes up several hundred percent that's where that comes in now more importantly than your own psyche what's more important with that part of the equation is that's where the real money is and that's how you make money with this methodology is capturing some of those bigger trends a lot of people say well Dave you have your smallest position uh, some people believe in pyramiding well pyramiding is fine but I think you can get in a lot of trouble doing that and that adds a layer of complexity. It adds more moving parts. And it also adds a bit of a blow-up characteristic, or at least, at the least, it adds the potential for a big drawdown. Okay? Remember, you can make 1,000%, but you can only lose 100. So it doesn't matter how much money you make. If at some point in time you lose too much, and 100 is the magic number there, you're out of business. And most people consider themselves out of business with a 50% drawdown, unless you're a few of these sacred cow people out there who could draw down more than 50% and people still invest with them and think they're still God. But I don't want to digress and point out who that is. Um, but anyway, a lot of people say half is enough. Uh, or I'm sorry, half is not enough. Half is enough, okay? Uh, if you capture a major, major trend, then a position half the size of where you started is just fine. And like I said last week, if you're a little bit more advanced and that market is so great, it cooperates. Sometimes you can swing trade around that longer term position and squeeze out an extra few swing trades. In other words, swing trade around that core position as it sets up uh, in, in the trend in the future trend. For instance, if you pulls back, takes off, pulls back, takes off, pulls back, takes off, then maybe you could play these swing trades, rinse and repeat during this longer term trend and that will squeeze out some extra money. Uh, stops and trailing stops, of course we could always be wrong on any given trade about how great it looks. Bad things could happen in the world. Um, bad things could happen to a company. Okay, So you want to make sure you have those stops in place. It's going to take you out of stocks that might not have any potential. Sometimes of course we get into a stock Big day thinks it's great, looking good in the world. Nice little pullback begins to rally, and then what happens? Implodes and dies. Okay, it happens. Okay, more than I wanted to, but I'm working on avoiding that. Okay, and as I'll touch upon again, as usual, a good offense is going to help this, but not totally mitigate it. So no matter how great a setup looks, we know we can't be wrong. So your stop is going to take you out of that, and if market conditions begin to change your stops are going to take you out of that for the most part and it's also going to take you out of stocks that have run their course and I think that's what have run is correct English on that that oh, I forgot to put the have in wow I'm so focused on my grammar I left out the word have okay h-a-v-e that have run their course and if somebody disagrees with run let me know I think English is my second language, being a Cajun. I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this stock because it sort of defied gravity. And we have the S&P plotted in the background. Now, there's no scaling to this. So just look at them as two different charts. But notice that the S&P peaked out here. And then pretty much imploded, as you know. And if you, unless you've been under a rock for the last week or so, 
you probably <laughs> you probably already know that, okay? So it's nothing earth shattering. But you can see during that time period, this stock had a pretty good run. Now it's begun to correct a little bit, so it's not as good as an example, and it's bounced back. So it's about right here now, I think. Let's come back a little bit, maybe here, okay? But as you can see, uh, last day or so notwithstanding, this stock had a pretty good run in spite of the overall market. It was able to diverge against the market, and a couple days ago, the market, I think, was down 3%. And this stock, during that same exact time, was up 25%. Now, this is a bit of an anomaly, but as you can see, it can happen. And this is why we don't freak out whenever the market starts looking a little iffy and run to the door or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, lose, maybe be in the 40 and slip in that sentence, but you don't want to just bail out on everything on all your longs just because the market's looking a little iffy. Yes, there's a good chance you will get stopped out on some, but so what? So what? The market may take you out of some trades, and those trades might be trades that you don't need to be in, and that's the market speaking for you. But then every now and then, it'll keep you in some of these trades that might have longer-term potential. And again, that's where the real money is. Now, I left this slide in from last week because it sort of dovetails into some of the things we're talking about this week. In addition, I wanted to add in the last uh, trade that stopped out, this AERI. Now, this isn't a portfolio. Or th these are closed trades, but this, this isn't the best run we've ever had, but we do have one big home run in here, as you can see. And you can see we have some small losses, okay, and a couple of small gains and some mediocre gains on the second part. So this sort of keeps your head above the water, and this is where you actually print money and really do really well. So I wanted to just kind of throw that back in to show how the partial profits worked. And the main reason I left it in here was I wanted to add in this new trade, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, okay? Now, don't answer me yet, but is everybody still thinking about why stocks exist? Keep thinking about it, and I'm going to ask for an answer in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to tell a little story about trading sardines. Now, this is an age-old story when it comes to the markets. And I couldn't really find a source to attribute it to, but I know personally I read it in a book by, and I'm 99% sure, I wish I could find a book to verify it, but according to Internet searches, it was written in a book by a, a man, a gentleman by the name of Stanley Kroll. Stanley Kroll was a commodity trader, and back in my CTA days, very early on in the 80s, uh, late 80s, I guess, uh, I probably read this book. So uh, I'm going to give him credit for the story. And there's a lot of variations of the story. I'll just tell somewhat of a, a conglomerate, I guess, of those stories. Essentially, there was these, um, there was a run on sardines at one point in time. And sardines became very expensive and harder and harder to come by. So much so, the price prices were becoming utterly ridiculous. And people were trading these cans of soybeans, and the price kept going up and up and up and up and up to, to a point where it was just an absolute bubble. And one of the poor gentlemen's gentlemen's one of the poor guys who bought towards the end of this cycle decided, you know what? I'm gonna open up my can of sardines and treat myself to this very expensive meal. And when he did, he found out that the sardines were rotten. So he immediately runs to the guy he bought them from, complains, and the guy says, you silly fool, those sardines were for trading and not eating. Okay, so in case you're wondering where I'm going, let's take a look at this little sardine stock here. This is AERI. I have no idea what this company does. I know it's a pharmaceutical, okay, but I have no idea what they do. And pharmaceuticals have it doing really well. 
up until very recently. Pharmaceuticals have been going up. The overall market has been going up, led mostly by pharmaceuticals. So I see this hot IPO in here pulling back. Now IPOs trade mostly on excitement and euphoria, so they can be wonderful vehicles to trade with technical analysis because that's what technical analysis is at its utmost essence is reading the emotions of the market. And this is one reason why I like IPOs. If all you did was trade IPOs, I think you'd be very successful. You would have a lot of flat times where there's nothing to do, but that's a good thing. It could be, as one of my clients says, self-policing or self-regulating. In that, when the market gets a little iffy, you're not going to see a lot of IPOs. I actually was thinking late last year, because we were doing so great in IPOs, that I could do maybe a separate service, um, which would be available to people my main service for free, but maybe a, a separate service with just traded IPOs. Unfortunately, though, there'd be a lot of flat times where there's nothing to do, and that might be okay. That might keep you out of bad markets, but I digress. The point I'm trying to make here is this thing looked good from a sector perspective, from an overall market perspective, from an IPO euphoric type of trade. And what did it do? Well, we got our initial profit targets out of it right around here. From here to here, 60% move, better than the poke of the eye. And as you can see, it began to take off. Okay. Now, instead of trailing that stop up really tight, we sort of took our time getting it out. We got it up to break even. And then we kind of took our time and let the stock widen out. And the hope was that it would correct and then take off again. Unfortunately, it did not. It stopped out for a 10% gain. And on the 100K portfolio, that's 600 bucks. Better than poke of the eye. That's uh, six tenths of a percent. And this is a 1% gain. Okay, you're not going to get rich like that. But, you know, over the time period, it wasn't that many weeks. If you annualize that out, that's probably a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent number, a number that most money managers would probably kill for to have that if you consistently made that much. But the point I'm bringing, re reason I'm bringing this up is, is that this is not going to be your bread and butter, but here's a trade that I do very little about the underlying company, but you're able to make money in the trade. And it turns out to be, I wouldn't say a wash, but it turns out to be better than a poke in the eye. Okay? So, why do stocks exist? All right, let's let's answer that question. Anybody have the answer to why stocks exist? From your perspective, to raise capital. No, wrong. To raise capital. No, that's from a company's perspective. From your perspective, why do stocks exist? To drive us crazy. Ah, true. <laughs> stocks provide the financial market liquidity. No, that's from an institutional standpoint. Why do stocks exist from your standpoint, okay? To make money. All right, that's it. We got the answer. To make money. Good. Steve, to make money. Phil, to make money. Peter, <laughs> to have some fun. <laughs> D, to make money, to make money, to make money, to make me money. Yes! That's why stocks exist. That's the only reason they exist. Steve, close enough to trade. Okay? No, not to legalize gambling. So stocks exist for one and only one purpose. For us. And that's for us to make money. You have to... Take that sardine approach to stocks. You can't care about them. You can't fall in love with them. Okay? And it getting a little philosophical coming into this presentation, yesterday I was thinking about what I was going to talk about. And this AERI just keeps coming back 
in my head. And it's a stock I don't know a lot about. I have no idea what kind of drugs they're making. I just knew that they were IPO and they made drugs. And those are two hot things right now, or at least they were two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And that's all I knew. Other than that, it's just a blip on the screen. Now, I do, I wouldn't say I collect stock certificates, but um, I have a collection of stock certificates, which I put on one wall of my office for decoration. And the reason I'm saying this is it used to be that you actually did have a physical sort of representation of the company many years ago. So there was something physical there. Okay, you had a piece of paper with a pretty, uh, some sort of, usually a pretty woman or a half-naked man, uh, or sometimes one of each. Uh, <laughs> you think I'm being silly, but if you look at some of these stock certificates, or at least some sort of pretty graphic, um, and they're they're very beautiful. If you if you um, if you're looking for a cheap decoration for your office, uh, collect some of these. Um, uh, what do you call them? Cancel stock certificates. They're just absolutely beautiful. Uh, anyway, so with at least with a stock certificate, you had some sort of physical representation of the company. But with nowadays, or the way things work, all you have is some electronic blips on your screen. Now, this is a long-winded way of saying that it's kind of abstract, or it's so abstract to where it's just this electronic blips on your screen, and that should help you to get become even less attached to the company, to care even less about what they do. There's no longer, for the most part, these physical shares that you actually can hold on to. It's just some blips on the screen. So your job is to look at the chart, trade the chart, and when the market decides to take you out, let the market take you out and then look for the next opportunity. So take this antiseptic approach. Don't care. Don't care about what's in the can, okay? Don't care about the actual sorting. Just care about whether or not the stock is moving in your favor or not. And if it's not, the stop will take care of itself. If it is, the trailing stop will take care of uh, that and keep you or hopefully keep you in the position for a long, long time. Now, let me just rehash real quick some trading 101. Okay, so trade them, trade stocks. Okay, trade being the key word in that sentence. You want to practice proper money and position management. Waiting for entries, a lot of times that in and of itself will keep you out of trouble. I know a lot of people get really anxious. I'll say, hey, guys, I like this gold stock, uh, XYZ. Okay. Next day, I get an email. Dave, I bought XYZ. Well, wait a minute. It didn't trigger yet. Okay. Stock just starts just, just going down. Why did you buy it? Well, I just wanted to jump in. No. Wait for an entry. Okay. That in and of itself can often keep you out of trouble. Now, once you get in, you want to honor your stop. You want to make sure that stop is set outside of the normal volatility of the market. There's been some famous, and I know one or two of you guys have uh, followed this in the past, but there's a famous system out there that says use an 8% stop. Well, that's like saying we should all wear a medium shirt, a size medium shirt. That just doesn't make sense. You need to have that stop outside the normal volatility of the market to hopefully ride out that shorter term move at least and then possibly ride out a longer term move. Now, if you get stopped out, so what? Now, I say that and I act like I'm pretty cavalier about it. I'm getting more cavalier. I'm getting better as years go on. But yeah, I still drop an F-bomb or two. I dropped an F-bomb this morning. We got a short that's up tremendously today. It's just, it's just pissing me off. Okay, it is. But after I look at the chart, I said, well, so what? It stops me out. I don't care. You know, I I've reached a point now where if a stock stops me out, then it's like the hell with you. Good riddance. I'm glad that you were out of my portfolio. So now I could focus on the next possible opportunity as opposed to trying to hang on to that stock and hopefully that it come and hopefully someday it'll come back. Just learn how to forget about it. And then, of course, never forget where the real money is. 
So trail low stops and then allow them to widen out as the position moves more and more in your favor. That's what we were doing on the AERI, okay? Hoping that we would be able to ride out this correction that it was in. And then it turns into a longer term trend. But so far, it has not. RLYP might work out. Who knows? We don't know yet, right? Uh, you want to trade at a relatively small size, but you want to be consistent. For my methodology, I preach 2% of the portfolio if stopped out. A lot of people take on a big position. I was just on Woody Vincent's radio show yesterday, and we got talking about this very interesting concept. And it happens, in fact, we talked about it at the, um, I want to say money show, but it's Traders Expo back in Vegas. Those videos are for, not for Woody's uh, radio show, but for, Traders Expo are on my website, so check those out when you get a chance. And that's one of the things I talked about is that a lot of times people put on a big position and they'll get crushed. And then they're gun shy, so it's like, well, let me just kind of ease back in here. And they put on a little tiny position and they hit a home run. Well, that home run doesn't do them any good because they just got crushed in that huge position. And the only way you're going to consistently make money is... If you're keeping your bet size within reason, but you have to be consistent. So when you do hit that home run, you have a big enough position on to make it worthwhile. And then the bottom line, and I can't harp upon this enough, and this is something that I'm going to just beat the dead horse on in 2014, so get ready, is that a good offense is the best defense. And this is why I did that stock selection webinar a while back, or back in December, I should say, because I think it's vitally important to make sure you're in the best of the best stocks to begin with. And, and you know, part of the problem there, I think, comes from, from psychology once again, freshman psychology once again rearing its ugly head. I'm not sure. I mean, we've got some people in here that I'm blown away by your success. We've got some doctors in here, some lawyers in here. We've got some very smart, smart people that are in here often um, every week. And not to pick on you guys, but I'm saying that a lot of guys like you are very smart and then you're drawn to trading because I do think that trading attracts some of the brightest minds out there. Money attracts smart people. It's just a fact of life. You know, get, I know we all want to be a little altruistic here and there, but the reality is that's the reality of it is, okay? <laughs> Money attracts smart people. It is what it is. But in doing so, some of the same people who look for this perfection in life, these surgeons who have to be perfect, okay? The automatic transmission mechanic who leaves out a little bit of gear and the whole transmission blows up. He has to be precise in what he does. They look for eh, sometimes mediocrity in the markets. It's like they try to make something happen that isn't there. So make sure you pick the best of the best. And there's a lot of, it does take experience, but there's a lot of little things you can do to pick good stocks. And when I'm saying mediocrity, I mean, these stocks should jump out, out at you as being just straight sideways or chop it all over the place or have a big wad of resistance right above where they're trading. It's amazing some of the stocks I get asked about. Not that I have all the answers, but I certainly have the answers for those stocks. And don't trade them. Just trade the best and forget about the rest. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about transitions or continue my talk about transitions because we're at a critical juncture in the market. When we get to the individual sectors, you're going to see a lot of these transitions uh, beginning to play out. So it's vitally important to brush up on that uh, aspect. And as you know, transitions, you're looking for a market. You're not trying to pick that top, but you're waiting for that market to roll over, and you're looking to get in at that first sign of correction, provided, of course, that trend begins to resume. Okay, Picking a top is a loser's game. But waiting for the market to show signs that it may have topped, for instance, such a first thrust where a market is a sharp slide over and then begins to pull back a little, or a bow tie where you might have a more gradual rollover in the market and your moving averages come together and cross over. That's another transitional setup. Those are my two favorite transitional setups, and there's a couple of more out there. So check out um, 10 Best if you want the rest of those. Now, this is a, a somewhat dated chart. It's about a year old, but it's still re very much relevant. And this is a weekly chart, 
as you can see. And I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this, and I'm going to dust off this chart every time we're at an inflection point at all-time highs or decade lows. I'm going to take this chart out. We'll take a look at it. But you had a bow tie way up here, okay? And the market had a strong sell-off. That was the bear market of what, 2000? It took two years for that market to bottom out, and then what happened? You had a bow tie here. Now, the reason I'm pointing these out is these were major sells and major buys because in this case, it was all-time highs. In this case, it was multi, multi-year lows. I forget how many. I need to go back and look. Maybe 10-year lows. This one here was off uh, like a 13-year low. Now, this one took a little while to catch up because you had a bit of a V bottom, but you did have a, a lot of signals on the daily chart, which we're going to look at in just one second. And anyway, 2007, right about the beginning of 2008, you had a bow tie down on the weekly. So you can see these weekly bow ties, and I know by you guys that are here every week, are probably your eyes are glazing over by now because I show this chart so often. But these weekly bow ties can help you keep you on the right side of the market. But more importantly, or as important as that, it's good to pay attention to what's going on in the daily because the daily is going to turn a lot faster than the weekly. Now I have a minor sell in here. And I use the word minor because it was only about a year and a half or so high. So it's not coming off an all-time high. This here is a much more important signal than this one here. But some of these smaller signals can work out. In this particular case, it did. And then you had a minor buy here. And the market had a pretty good run from that minor buy. But the major buy, as far as I'm concerned, is still in place when you have these minor sells and minor buys when you're looking at the weekly chart. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the daily S&Ps. What do we have? We made all-time highs here. Remember, this is daily, and the market has begun to sell off. Obviously, this is the 10-day, I'm sorry, this is the 10-day simple. This is the 20-day exponential, and this is the 30-day exponential. As you can see, they're beginning to come together, and they could bow tie out soon. Okay, bow tie is, you can get it off my website. It's on there. Bow tie is when you, looks like a little bow tie. My drawing is not too good where the moving averages come together and begin to spread out. You can see they tried to come together back here, but they didn't quite, cro quite cross over. The, the market turned around and went right back up before that happened. Okay, So that's a daily bow tie. We could see a, a daily bow tie signal off of all-time highs. It's going to be a significant signal that should not be ignored. Now, keep in mind that not every bow tie is going to turn into or transitional pattern is going to turn into an all-time high top, or I should say an all-time top of the market, or may, I should say not an all-time, let's say a major top. Not every bow tie after an all-time high will turn into a major top, okay? But every major top after an all-time high will have a bow tie in it. So it certainly pays to pay attention when that occurs. Now let's take a look at the weekly chart. The weekly chart doesn't look that bad, okay? We just have a little bit of a blip kind of sideways in these bow tie moving averages. And so far, if you draw your big arrow, looks like we're still a longer term uptrend. So even though I showed you that major bow ties on the weekly chart, we're a long ways away from that happening. But you need to pay attention to the daily because the daily, especially on the short side, the daily is going to change a lot quicker than the weekly will. And one thing you do have to be careful with, especially at individual stocks, a lot of people look at the weekly charts for confirmation. And that's great. We trade off the daily. It's okay to look at the weekly for confirmation, but just realize that that weekly, especially on the short side, is going to be a little short, or, I'm sorry, a little slow to turn. So you might have a sell signal on that daily chart, and it might be a very viable, a very good sell signal, but that weekly is still going to be positive. That's one of the problems with the transitional setups is sometimes you're fighting the longer term trend. But like I often say, it's like the American pioneers. You're either going to get the gold or you're going to get arrows in your back. But the chances of capturing a major top make trading these transitional patterns worthwhile. A couple of um, random thoughts before we open it up to the charts and I, I get to your trading questions here. Uh, again, just take things one day at a time. Try not to make any big picture predictions. The market looked a little iffy a while back. Maybe selling everything was the thing to do. 
I don't know, and I will never know, okay? I no longer try to play that game. I just kind of uh, grit my teeth a little bit, let the stops take me out, let entries put me into new positions that I really, really like to begin with, okay? And that ebb and flow, let it let it play out in your, in your portfolio. If we get into a market that starts to chop around, you're going to get fewer and fewer setups. You're going to get less and less. Um, you'll get stopped out of some existing setups or all to a point where you end up being flat, and then you just wait. If the market keeps rolling over, you're going to get more and more shorts. You're going to stop out of your longs, and you end up net short. The bottom line, though, again, and this is going to be the theme for 2014, so get ready. You want to be selective. If you can't stand it, if you can't walk away and be okay, you see a trade, boy, you like it, you really, really like it, you can't stand it, you can't walk away and be okay, then take the trade, okay? But if it's not great and you're not that excited about it and you're willing to say, eh, it looks pretty good, it might take off, but the market's a little iffy, the sector's a little iffy, other stocks within the sec sector are a little iffy, eh, it's got some issues with it, it's got some gaps against the trade, it's got some overhead resistance, it's got this problem or that problem, eh, I can live without it. So what if it takes off without me, okay? Uh, a couple of announcements, and I want to answer your questions on trading. We've got a lot of good questions uh, coming in. Just an FYI, only one day left on uh, this. I have a special where if you sign up for a year of my service, you'll get the stock selection uh, webinar free. And the webinar uh, is going to go on sale February, not on sale, but uh, I'm going to start selling it. Uh, the, the initial price on that was fourteen sixty, and that's going to be the price after February 1st. So that's going to be your, uh, you'll get a whole year free of the service for signing up. Um, I'm sorry, if you sign up for one year of the service, you'll get the stock selection webinar, which is going to be priced at 1460 uh, free. Okay. Uh, volume two, the weekend charts is available. This is a really good way to, to get a lot of information for not a whole lot, if I say so myself. Uh, it's about 30 hours of these webinars. And then if you need like the entire volumes, uh, those are those are even cheaper of let's say 2012, and that's about 60 something hours of uh, broadcast. My first uh, couple of books are still relevant. Uh, just one thing I want to point out, two things to point out in here. Main thing is one, last day on the, uh, or second to last day on the special with the stock selection webinar. And the other thing too is um, I've been getting a few people asking me, it's kind of interesting, it, there was hardly any interest in this at all, so it took me a while to get around to doing it. Uh, but now, and, and I'm glad, I'm glad people want to see what I've actually done. Uh, so I've got the archives back up on the service. You can email me if you need the link on that. I'll put it eventually, on, I'll put it back on my trading service page, which is here. Uh, but if that link is not there now, I do have the archives up. I'm still moving them from uh, my personal space over to uh, a, a dedicated server like Amazon. But uh, they're up now and can be up, uploaded. Um, anyway, so I think most everybody here knows that I have a service. Now, let's answer some of these questions, and then we go, we're going to uh, open it up to the charts. And if you want to start asking about individual stocks, you can start now. What is a mean reversion trade? Okay, uh, Mean reversion, mean is just simply an average. Okay, If you look up average and mean, those two uh, terms can be used synonymously. So let's say the average stock price is here. The mean reversion trade suggests that the stock is going to return back to its mean. When it gets stretched one way, it's kind of like the dog walk, walking a dog on a leash. When it gets on one side of the sidewalk, it tends to be ended back to the other and rinse and repeat. This looks good in theory. In theory and practice, both are the same. In practice, they are not. If you've ever tried to trade the mean reversion trade, meaning you short it here, what happens? Well, the dog breaks the leash. It keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. One of my problems with the pure mean reversion traders is they say, uh, oh, okay, it's oversold. Just buy it here, and then the market goes here, okay? And so what do you do? No, don't use stops. Don't use stops. So eventually you're going to blow up, and that's why I talked about living in a van down by the river or more specifically a cardboard box at yesterday's uh, chart show. So that's the mean reversion trade. Now. I preach against mean reversion trading, and then a mean reversion trader who does use stops and who is successful, believe it or not, uh, told me, hey, Dave, you say you're anti-mean reversion, but aren't you playing reversions to the mean when you're playing pullbacks? And he is absolutely 
correct. We are looking for this reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend, okay? But we're not fighting the trend, and we're not buying this as it drops. We're buying it when that trend resumes. So we're playing reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend with the caveat that we will wait for entry and use a stop. And that's the entire methodology in a nutshell right there, okay? Okay, uh, yeah, Jerry's saying, Dave, yesterday you said a bow tie off of all-time highs at intersects with the 50-day DMA is a strong signal. Can you go over this more today? Yeah, when we get to the charts, I'll pull that up for you, Jerry. Um, sometimes you get a bow tie that's that's really that looks like that, and you got a 50-day moving average. So it has a strong inflection point, okay, very sharp to the moving average. And that just says that this market here has begun to fall so hard that these moving averages are just pointing straight down, okay? And we'll look at that, okay? Is that guy the good guy, the bad, or the ugly? Where's his cigar? It's Clint Eastwood. I guess he's, well, you know, I've never, that's a, what, a fistful of dollars? No, that's a good, the bad, and the ugly. I've actually never seen the whole movie. Okay. Yeah, I hear you, Frenchie. Where is your stop on RLYP? Well, let me see if we could look at this without bringing it up. The stop on RLYP is is going to be twenty nine fifty. Okay. Martin says, are these archives for weekly show or daily service videos? Uh, the free archives are of every trading service that I've ever done over the last 10 years or so, and those there are videos in there. Uh, I don't know if the old videos are going to be still around because there were different servers back then, but the first few years are going to be all of my videos, and then going back further in time, they're going to be uh, paper copies so to speak, okay, of that. The archives of these shows, as you know, are free, uh, but the archives, because of processing and such, are, are not. So if you want to buy the archives of these shows, um, they're on my website, okay? So do you wait for a bow tie in the direction of the trend? You wait for a bow tie in the direction of the new trend, okay? And we'll I'll point that out when we get to the charts. In fact, we could, we could do this now, okay? Uh, in the case of the S&P, okay, see, your your trend here, you're at an all-time high here and your all-time high here, okay? First of all, you don't want to argue with all-time highs, okay? If a market's making all-time highs, then it's in a trend. It's in an uptrend. It might be losing steam, but it's in an uptrend. Until it begins to do something wrong, it's still in an uptrend. Now, When it begins to sell off, you can see that these moving averages begin to head lower. And even without the moving averages, you can see the sell-off in the background. Don't depend too much on the moving averages because you will have some lag with that. So, so far, it's been a bit of a first thrust down. Okay. One thing good, while I could still draw on this chart, we're going to jump out, jump out to the overall market in just one second. Even though we sold off real hard yesterday, as I said in, in the newsletter this morning, one thing good is, and also my service last night, is we did find support right around the prior low in here. So it wasn't a route where the market just dropped and dropped and kept on going. It just looked a little sold out in here. And it didn't surprise me to see the futures up sizable amount uh, this morning. And the bounce today doesn't surprise me. I'm not saying that I would come in and try to trade that bounce. I'm just saying it doesn't surprise me. Okay. <laughs> Stocks exist so brokerages can exist to employ people to pay taxes so government can get money to spend on pork to get reelected so they can invest in businesses that constituencies work for excessive rich. Ooh, Howard. <laughs> Howard not happy today. <laughs> No. Okay, Matt says, since you would have a lot of flat time, if you only traded IPOs, would you have to increase your bet size slash risk to maximize your gains? 
that you would typically expect. Well, we are all traders in here, and I think everybody in here is looking to be longer term successful. So my point with IPOs is that if you weren't successful or if you're not successful yet, then maybe just trade IPOs, and if that's all you did, specialize in that, I think you would be successful. But longer term, you definitely still want to trade the core methodology and trade stocks outside of just those IPOs because sometimes that's where you can still, believe it or not, have some tremendous uh, gains. In fact, sometimes you'll have, sometimes the IPOs are harder to hold on to those longer term trends because they can whipsaw you out once that initial euphoria wears off, where sometimes these stocks, like what I call the Phoenix stocks, and I don't want to beat the dead horse in SPWR, but it comes, that's the first one comes to mind, where the stock comes in and bottoms out for a year or so or whatever, and then mounts this mother of all trends that last two or three years off of that big, nice base in here. So I'm not saying that you should trade only that. What, I, what I'm proposing is you trade my methodology and you look through a couple thousand charts every day or pay me to do it for you or some combination thereof, treat me as part of your staff and trade the core methodology and then take a look at these IPOs as ancillary setups. Now, again, if you're not, if you're not successful to begin with, then maybe pick one little aspect of trading such as IPOs, or maybe one even better would be one pattern and look at the, all those stocks. Maybe just trade persistent pullbacks or one of these little patterns that you that catches your uh, catches your fancy or whatever, something you like, something that makes sense with your psyche. Trade one of these patterns until successful, and then add on these additional patterns. Okay. Okay, your bow tie crosses a different price level than the ES is trading at the time. Which one do you use? I use cash for my bow tie and my analysis. I'm not worried about the um, the e minis or whatever. I've got I've got those on another screen. Um, but markets are markets, and it shouldn't make that big of a difference. Okay. Craig is dumb as a brick. Well, you're gonna make a good trader. <laughs> Don used to be a transmission mechanic. That's right. Okay. Okay. Don says, uh, Don Old, not Don, even with pro uh, proper m money and position management sizing, don't you psych psychologically have, have to be prepared for a drawdown of 15 to 20% of your portfolio? Yes. I would say yes. And, um, I've been fairly lucky throughout the years, especially with my public portfolio. Uh, not that I haven't had bad drawdowns in my career, and I mean I've been involved with funds that got wiped out. I've, uh, I mean I've got my battle scars. Don't get me wrong, but I've been fairly lucky in that in my public life or my public profile, the drawdowns have not been that 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 extreme. Okay, but yeah, it does happen. And I would say that that would probably be a good estimate to brace for because sooner or later that will that will happen. You will get whacked a little bit, uh, and you will have a pretty uh, substantial drawdown uh, in 15 to 20 percent. That's probably not uh, that's that's probably about what you should brace for. Uh, anything worse than 20 percent, that's when it starts getting a little bit ugly. And if you look at the charts that I think I put in all of my books. Uh, at 20%, what do you have to make back at 20%? I don't know if I could find it quickly enough. You got to have a pretty big gain to get out of a 20% hole. It's probably like 30% or so. Maybe somebody could do the math on that. 0.8x equals 1. Do the math on that for me. Would that just be 1 divided by 0.8? Is that how that works? 1 divided by 0.8 equals. Yeah, you got to you got to make 25%. And if once you take your D, uh, so you got to make 25% back, and then once you get Below 20%, that's where it starts to grow geometrically, okay? 25% is not that that crazy to make back. But once you get any further than that, then it gets tougher and tougher, okay? Okay. Ooh, that's a, that's a tough stock to trade, that IRE. Yeah. 
Okay, we'll look at that when we get to the, the individual stocks, okay? As a former consultant, it took me a long time to realize that what I thought of a company was irrelevant. Amen. It is what the majority of majority thinks of a stock. Yeah, and you know, that's where I, I keep quoting and that was the, the beauty of this this uh meeting I went to last spring in uh in uh in New Orleans for the um, AAPTA. Uh, Tom McClellan's a member and he got up and spoke and he said it just was a little gem. He said, uh, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with that company. And I guess in that relationship, you're expecting the, the company to behave a certain way and have uh, uh, the best interest of making money in mind, making the most about amount of money ethically in mind, and not cooking the books, and et cetera. But you're also, I mean, that's expected, but you're also forming a relationship with everybody else who's ever bought that company, Okay. And you know, has something changed in AERI over the last few days? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't care. I don't watch the news. It was just a can of sardines to me, right? But something probably didn't change. Just some people decided to sell the stock. Okay. But that doesn't mean I should hold on because what if more people decide to sell that stock? So I formed a relationship with those other people too. And as Tom says, those people will screw you. Okay. Yes, John, the service archives are still available. I'll put a link on the service page if it's not already there. And uh, if you need it sooner than that, till I get around doing that, just shoot me an email. But, yeah, the, the links. And once you log, if you log into the service on the service page, you have the more recent archives, and then there's a link to the older archives. But, yeah, I'll, I'll get you that link if you need it. Be happy to. Can have an IPO indicator when it's safe to go into the water. Yeah, I think so. Uh, the only problem is it's going to be a little. There's going to be a lot of lag in that. Um, and and what what Sharon is asking is maybe is there an IPO indicated by the number of IPOs coming public uh, as to where we are in the cycle? And the fact that it's that, that they were just so great a month ago and it felt so good, I thought to myself, hmm. The fact that I even want to go out there and, 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 and show people how great they are and maybe even have a service built on these uh, suggests that we're probably closer to the top, uh, in, at least in the IPO market. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you'd be depending on, on, and I hate to use the word, non-professionals to, to, to do your top picking and your bottom picking. But uh, I, I'd imagine then... I'd imagine in much of the downtrend of 2008, you probably didn't see a whole lot of IPOs come public. So I, I don't know. I think you'd be better off watching the market. I'd be a little cautious of any type of indicator based on something like that. But I think it would be it would be something fun to watch, okay? If you're not seeing a whole lot of new IPOs, then, hmm, maybe it is self-policing itself. Maybe these people are thinking, hmm, this market stinks. I better back off a little bit. But we're smarter than that. We can look at where the market is, where the market was, and draw our arrows and determine whether or not either conditions are changing or have actually uh, flat out turned. Okay. Okay. Tono says, how do you create the bow tie? Is it the EMA or SMA? What numbers? Okay. Uh, get the article off my website under education. 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. The reason I use the 10 simple is I like to see where the market has traded over the last two weeks, so that's a true representation of price. And then further out, I like the exponential moving averages since they catch up a little faster. And I found that the combination of these three could be pretty cool for helping, uh, nothing magical, but helping predict the, um, the market. Uh, well, okay, Howard says on RLYP, why put a stop, a stop on top of support where it seems like a logical target? Well, sometimes these logical targets will happen. And, and that just happens. So his point is that there's some support where my stop is, and it seems like it would be a target. Well, what happens is when you first get into a position, let's see if we can do it here. When you first get into the position, and as that position begins to move in your favor, you take those partial profits. That's sort of a mechanical type of thing. You're kind of moving that up in a lockstep, but then you're getting it to break even once you achieve that. Now, once that is achieved, then we let this widen out, okay? So early in the process, yes, that stop might be near support or whatever. Uh, 
But as it widens out and goes more and more, and then sometimes you get lucky and your stop widens out to a point where you could survive this major, major base, okay? And then it takes off again, and your stop, again, yeah, ends up below that base. And then uh, you let it widen out even more and maybe not start widening that stop out until this number becomes a little bit more extreme in here. So, yeah, there's nothing perfect about where the stops are going to be set other than we allow it to widen out to hopefully be able to ride out those longer-term corrections. Remember, we're changing our hats from that swing trade hat to that longer-term trading hat. In a case like AERI, we never did get that swing trade hat off. So we had that swing trade stop, got stopped out of the swing trade stop for the most part. RLYP, we haven't got that huge gain out of that stock yet, and hopefully yet be the key word in that sentence. So we haven't changed our hat just yet on that one, okay? I will send you a presentation. Yeah, Phil's got some good stuff. He says, I will send you a presentation. Number of IPOs per month from 1985 to 2000 was around 30, range from fewer than 5 to 100. Okay, that'll be something fun to uh, take a look at. Okay. All right, let's hop into the charts, and I'll try to answer. What I'll do is uh, some of the remaining questions uh, in general, I'll try to answer. Uh, in relationship to the charts. In fact, well, you know what? Let me just do this real quick. Let me get a fresh update, and then I'll answer uh, to know as a question on the bow ties. Um, what you're doing with all of, uh, like, the transitional setups, you're waiting for some sort of obvious change in trend, and then you're waiting for a bit of a pullback. That might be a one-bar pullback or or more, Okay. With a transitional setup, you don't necessarily, let's say you've got this, what appears to be a major transition in place, a major turn and trim. You don't wait for this thing to have a nice deep pullback like we would on uh, maybe a stock that's going kind of straight up, wait for kind of a deep pullback. You're waiting for the first little signs of correction, and then you look at the inner if and only if that trend begins to reassert itself. As I preach, Look for first thrust first. The first thrust is going to look like that in the market, as opposed to waiting for that moving average to cross over. Uh, okay, but if you do see the moving average cross over like that, especially when it's over a short period of time and has that appearance of a bow tie spreading out from one direction to the other, that suggests that the trend has changed and that your shorter term and your somewhat intermediate cycles have uh, changed. Intermediate term cycles have changed and that maybe you have a possible trend uh, change in the works. And you'll see, uh, you'll see the first thrust first if, if it's a sharp sell-off. Sometimes you get a market that makes a more gradual sell-off, and then the uh, bow ties, I'm sorry, the first thrust will then appear. Sometimes the first thrust may never appear. Sometimes you might just get a bow tie first, okay? So let me show you in one live chart, and then what I want to do is I want to, let's, let's bang out the market real quick. And then we'll look at the uh, individual stocks. Take a look at like GME, which is a short in the portfolio. And notice what happened here was it made all-time highs. Now, again, I like to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The stock made all-time highs, but these are just marginally above these all-time highs here. So you've got one, two, almost three months of trading where it really didn't make a whole lot of forward progress. But it made everybody happy that was long, at least at this juncture, because it's making all-time highs, okay, right around here. And then you got a sharp sell-off, and then you got a pullback. So this is reversal gap strategy. It's also a first thrust. And then if we put the bow ties in here, you can see that the bow ties quickly caught up. Now, keep in mind, there's going to be some lag in the bow ties. But in this case, the reason that the bow ties caught up so fast was because this stock had lost steam over the last 30 days. So when this thing began to break, your bow ties began to form too. So look for this first thrust first, this first thrust down. But sometimes you'll get the, sometimes the bow tie will actually show up first. But if the market is making a sharp, let's say a market begins to sell off, don't sit around and wait for this bow tie to form because this market may implode so fast that it might take a few days for that bow tie to catch up. And then it's going to be too late to short it. Okay, remember they slide faster than they glide is one of the few true Wall Street adages out there. Okay, but yeah, check out the. There's an article on transitions on on the website. Check that out first, and uh, we could always uh, bring them up. Okay.
<laughs> yeah, I'm glad they exist. We're still getting answers on why stocks exist. <laughs> Keep the casino going. Good idea. Okay. Yep. I'm glad they're here. Okay. Let's take a look at the uh, overall market, and um, and then we'll whittle it down. Yeah, Tano, Tano says he uses 10 simple and 34 exponential. That's fine. Uh, whatever you're used to using, uh, don't. It's not my way or highway. Maybe uh, take a look at the bow tie, see if it makes sense to you. But yeah, if you have something you're already using, don't let me mess up what you're already doing, provided you're already successful. Okay. But I think almost in any methodology, I, you know, and I and I say the story over and over. But I was I was gift I was gifted I was blessed to be part of a, a team which had some really really impressive people on the team and me somehow I don't know how but somehow and uh, a lot of these guys were a lot more complex than me and a lot smarter than me but when I showed them some of this money management techniques where you open it up to the longer term volatility to the longer term trend the taking of the partial profits etc to my surprise. Uh, some of these guys on the team were, were um, somewhat blown away by that and actually were kind of bragging on how well it can work. So there's a lot, I think, that uh, even as simple as it is, that regardless of your complexity, there's a lot that I do that I think is not bragging, but I'm just saying it's conceptually correct and makes a lot of sense. And it's to me it's somewhat obvious, but, but you'd be surprised um, how sometimes in the overcomplication of things you overlook the obvious. Now, Let's talk about these P's real quick. Um, we now have almost a complete crossover into bow ties. There's nothing magical about that. Obviously, we already have a bit of a slide in here. I mean, I guess technically that uh, first thrust triggered yesterday. Okay, We're getting a little bit of a bounce back. We'll likely have a bow tie down off of all-time highs over the next couple of days. Uh, pay attention to that setup. Hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully this is just a major correction or in a uh, or not so major correction in a longer term uptrend you can see we've had some pretty serious slides throughout it hasn't been a route straight up in here so hopefully and again you had to use the word hope but hopefully this is just another one of those corrections let's put the 50 day moving average in since it is well watched okay and we'll put the 50 day simple moving average in now one thing i was being asked about earlier was angle of attack okay you could see that, not quantifying it, but just kind of drawing your lines on these moving averages, your angle of attack against the 50 is fairly sharp in here. Let's just redraw this. Let me just draw an arrow in between the three of them. Okay. You could see that this, or just follow the 10 day, will be easy. Okay. So the angle of the attack against the 50 is pretty sharp. This suggests that you have a fairly major change in trend. But we don't just go off of one signal in and of itself. We want to see what's going to happen next. Okay, so now we're in this pullback from oversold. We're having a pretty good day here, and you got to realize that market was sort of was coming unglued for about a week. We had yesterday's action where it really couldn't get past yesterday's low. I'm sorry, Monday's low, and then today we're having a pretty good bounce back. So if this thing comes bouncing right back then we may have dodged a bullet, okay? Right now, at this particular moment, looks pretty ugly, but let's just wait and see. So, yes, that's your angle of attack. The sharper this angle is down into the 50, uh, usually the more significant the new, the new developing trend is, okay? But let's just take it one day at a time. Let's just see what happens. If the market, let's just clean this chart up and get back to a 50-day moving average, Okay. 50-day can do a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. As I often preach, if all you did was pay attention to the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, for the most part, you would stay on the right side of the market, especially if you made sure, if you didn't just hop right in, because you get whipsawed if you hopped in too much. But if, as a general statement, you say, okay, we got mostly daylight here. I want to be long. We got a little daylight to the downside. The market may be rolling over, but let's not rush out and sell a farm just yet. Comes back up. You got daylight again. A little daylight here, okay? But fortunately, every time it's dipped below that 50-day moving average for the past couple of years, 
it has found support and turned right back up. Now, the question is, will it do that now? I don't know, okay? But we're going to pay attention and see what happens. Uh, if the market gets back above its 50, especially since it's dropped so far below it, then we may have dodged a bullet. We might back off on shorting a little bit and maybe start thinking about the long side again, okay? And if it goes sideways, then we'll avoid uh, both sides of the market. Now, one thing to look at it here is this 50-day has flattened out, and it's almost on the cusp of a negative slope. So that's the other thing you can look at. And you can use whatever moving average you want. I'm only showing the 50 for this analysis because it is well watched, okay, out there, the 50-day simple. But you can see you have daylight and positive slope. If all you did was trade with the positive slope in the daylight, okay, then you would stay on the right side of the market for the most part. I wouldn't – I'd stop short of trying to test it out because – it might not test out because there was some occasional whipsaw here and there. But during that whipsaw, you'd probably want to be completely out of the market anyway and wait for that slope to change to positive to negative or from, from whatever or from flat to positive or from flat to negative and wait for that daylight. Okay? But very simple concept to help keep you on the right side of the market. Right now, it's looking a little iffy. I'm not going to rush out and say the sky is falling and call a big top, but I am telling you it's looking a little iffy. But a few big up days would make all the difference in the world. In fact, let's just measure that in the comp. We are, okay, with today's rally, we're 2.65% away from multi-year highs, okay? So if you had a couple of big days in here, you could be all the way back to the new highs, and we may have dodged a bullet. One thing that I've liked this in this last bull leg for a considerable amount of time is every time we have a little bit of a spill, they come rushing out with the skies falling, the skies falling. We got a wave count, we got a a, a bar count of a three x extension or whatever, and it's some sort of top. Well, the market has not topped in spite of all of these calls. Okay, so that's one thing I've liked about it. And every time the market gets a little iffy, the bears just come flying out of the woodwork. This may be the top. I don't know. Okay. But we're going to let the portfolio ebb and flow, take us out of our longs, put us into a few new shorts, and we'll see how things shake out. If the market continues to rally, then we'll get stopped out of the shorts, and we'll get some longs back on. So NASDAQ, uh, if, you take the, if you take the 50 out, it does look a little iffy in the fact that if you just draw on this, you can see, okay, it is kind of a bit of a first thrust type of setup in here, but it's not that far off all-time, I'm sorry, multi-year high, so a few big updates will make all the difference in the world. The other thing that's kind of cool with the NASDAQ, and it's a little bit cleaner than the P's, is if you back the chart way out, you can see for about the last year and change, it's just barely kind of come down to kiss that moving average before resuming its longer-term trend, okay? So hopefully this is just one more kiss of the average. My point is longer term uptrend still intact even in the S&P. Uh, shorter term trend beginning to look a little questionable in here. Uh, the other thing that's been sort of a good thing lately, not a great thing but a decent thing, is to take a look at bonds and to those keeping score we had a little bow tie uh, off this major double bottom in here just recently off of multi-year lows so that's a fairly significant, significant signal. Bonds in general have been headed higher so it's not like the market is selling off and the baby's being thrown out with the bathwater and even bonds are being sold in some sort of liquidation type of market. When you see bonds go down, gold go down, and stocks go down at the same time, that's when you need to get a little scared and a little bit concerned. But if you see gold rally a little bit when the market's selling off and bonds rally a little bit, that suggests a bit of a flight to safety, and that's a good thing. Now let's just take a look at some of these sectors in here. Uh, this is a little bit concerning. If you go through these sectors, you can see there's quite a few either bow ties or first thrusts or combinations thereof in quite a few sectors. And uh, we've got uh, insurance. You can see recently made. Remember, at a new high, everybody is happy. But as soon as this begins to implode, then these people are now at an instant loss, and they become a hurt and pup really quick. Take a look at computer hardware, all-time highs, then begins to break down, led mostly by Apple. Um, the semiconductors are sort of a first thrust in the year, but you have a lot of support under the market. So I'm not too worried about those guys. 
but there's a lot of other sectors that have just made these all-time highs like chemicals and then they've imploded and then kind of pulling back a little bit in here so that looks a little questionable in here transports have kind of done the same thing they're a little bit more of a micro level but you can see they lost some steam and now they're beginning to pull back look at a little scary in here a couple of areas like banks have hit these brand new highs I'm not gonna bore you and go through too many more because a lot of sectors look like that but you can see so far thrust down beginning to set up probably as a bit of a first thrust and will probably be a bow tie if not yeah it's a bow tie down in those sectors so a lot of sectors look a little questionable in here with the exception of the gold stocks and the gold stocks a little sloppy in here but they've come down to these multi-year lows okay and they form this bow tie off of those lows so maybe just maybe a bottom is in place and that's why we are going after some of these gold stocks not doing us too good today but if this market continues to slide or if gold in and of itself decides to just go up regardless of the market what the market does we'll be doing pretty good consumer non durables one of those areas that's been weak for a while selling off hard beginning to pull back in here retail has been another one of those areas too okay when you see an area like this this looks like a top is, is certainly in place whereas the Nasdaq you're like well is it just a pullback is it a top or is it a transition it's kinda like eh, it's somewhere in between but if you look at retail and you look at consumer non durables and a lot of these other sectors in here then you're gonna see that a lot of areas do look like they they have possibly made tops especially when you see something like retail that makes like a double top and then forms the bow tie or the first thrust or the reversal gap whatever down afterwards that's kind of like a big picture technical pattern in place plus uh, a shorter term swing trade type of pattern on top of it so it could suggest major top is in place now only other sector I want to kind of point out because most are going to have the reoccurring same theme, same theme but uh, drugs and it's good to see drugs getting a nice bid today and biotechnology too biotechnology sold off so hard that it was on the cusp of any additional weakness would be concerned but you can see now it's beginning to uh, rally back up in here so so far so good on the biotech uh, stocks my only concern about the biotechs is they had been some internal weakness within biotechs and this is why see I look at everything so you gotta look at everything but there have been a, quite a few of these biotech stocks have, that have broken down so now it's getting a, a little late in the cycle and like I said they could be priced for perfection and by that meaning that as soon as they have one little bad earning or bad something come out these stocks begin to tumble hard. Maybe they're a little overbought longer term. And if you just back the chart way, way out in these stocks, you can see that they've had a pretty darn good run. Not that you want to try to guess the end of the trend, because that's how we make our money, is we just stick with a trend thinking that it's going to last forever. But we know in the back of our heads it eventually ends. So I'm less excited about the biotechs now than I was when they were they were in this nice, sharp uptrend uh, it, it, going higher now the markets beginning to get a little iffy I'm more excited about something like gold coming off of low levels even though stocks could be really choppy and they're not going to give me these incredible moves like biotech will okay but I'm more excited about that than I am about buying some of these stocks that are already in extended trends it doesn't mean that I'm not going to take the setups as they occur I'm just going to have to really like the setup and maybe focus on on some setups that I think have a little bit more upside potential then oppose it to buying these ones that are way, way up here at these multi-year highs. All right, that's enough sector analysis. Let's open up for individual software sector. Yeah, software looks like it's in trouble, uh, Sarah. And let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. I find that after a while, it's like if they all start looking, looking the same. Uh, software is sold off. Actually, software is a little bit better than the rest of them. But you can see it's sold off again, and now it's beginning to pull back. So it's at a bit of an inflection point here and notice that your bow ties haven't really come in that much just yet and you are also you're also uh, you're only less than two percent off all-time high so um, let me take that back what I said uh, software is still okay it, ha it does have a micro first thrust look to it being a small first thrust not a big obvious one like some of these other sectors that we've seen so it looks a little questionable, but certainly the longer term trend so far is it an uptrend. You definitely want to make sure you're waiting for an entry and a setup here. And you also want to make sure you're trading the best stocks uh, going in there. All right, Calvin wants to talk about URZ. I'm a fan of uranium. Uh, URZ is just a little too wild and crazy, okay? 
And that's the problem with these uranium stocks. They could just be wild and crazy, okay? But notice that it did make a bottom of these major, major lows, and it has taken off. I would probably pass on that one just because it's so crazy. Take a look at the ETF overall, and that might be the way to play these uraniums. I've been a bull on these guys for a long time. As you can see, they kind of bottomed out in here have broken out and pulled back a little bit. So I think you're better off playing that. But notice you've got uh, quite a few days of the pullback. So you want to see this take off within the next few days. If they're not, if they don't, if it doesn't take off soon, you might want to just avoid that too. Okay. AXU for Mr. Phil. How cold is it over there, Phil? It's been cold here lately. Not used to this. The good news is I'll be back in shorts over the weekend. We don't, uh, it, it, Louisiana, you don't pick up your shorts and your t-shirts. Uh, yeah, this looks okay. There's some other goals out there that might be a little bit better. But I certainly can't argue with this. Let's take a look at a, maybe a long, long term chart. Let's see something. Yeah, you're, you're down towards these almost all-time lows in this stock. So, yeah, I hear you. I can't argue with that. It looks okay. It looks all right. I think you can find some better goals out there. You're on the service. The two that are on the service I like better. IBIO I like. It's, it's a little thin stock, though. Oops. You know, the only problem with this is just super speculative. I mean, it made a major bottom in here. It's taken off. It's pulled back. I mean, this is, you know, don't put anything in this that you, if you're not willing to lose at all, okay? But yeah, I hear you. And at some point, it was up about seven bucks a share, so it does have a bit of that Phoenix stock look to it. Maybe it can return to its old glory. I hear you, Hong. I like the GDXJ. GDXJ is good. Uh, the reason I like that—that's a gold mine of juniors. Okay, if you go in, uh, somebody just asked about a little gold stock a minute ago. Very speculative, very dangerous to trade. But if you lump them all together. It takes a little bit of that volatility out, okay, but you still have enough to make it worthwhile trading. So that's why I do like the GDXJ, okay, because you're coming off of these all-time lows for the ETF, not for all the stocks, but for the ETF. And let's just throw a bow tie in there for S&Gs. And look, we have a bow tie off of all-time lows. It's a little sloppy. It took a while to form. But you can see, for the most part, it has kind of a – if you prefer, what do we have? We have a cup and handle, okay, off of those lows. So this looks like a major bottom is in place here, okay. So yeah, I like I like those a lot. Uh, you would enter above, I guess, yesterday's high on that one, okay. Yeah, uh, I actually had this as a short for my peeps, but uh, we didn't get a trigger. Uh, Calvin is asking about short cores. Uh, I would leave it alone for now. It's just kind of a choppy stock. It was kind of a stealthy setup when it did set up, set up to begin with. It looked like it was in trouble. It sort of made a bow tie, but then it kind of crawled right back up. We didn't get a trigger. Um, someday, this stock might be the mother of all shorts, but I think I would wait for it to break before uh, doing anything. Peter, you have identified my stock of the day. I cannot talk about that one, but yes, high five, uh, a big wet kiss to you on that one. Good job, Peter. Okay, Howard says, I look at the S&P X bow tie, but the average as being extended to the downside with support, October highs, December lows, also bouncing on 100, yes, 100 SMA, October lows, June lows, okay. Uh, your NG, okay. Yeah, I mean, he's seeing some other things there, and, you know, whatever type of analysis you want to use, that's fine, SP-500. Um now, what I'm saying is there's nothing magical about the bow tie, but every time, not every time, let me rephrase this, uh, every time you get a, a bow tie off of all-time highs or a bow tie off of uh, multi-year lows or all-time lows in a market, it pays to pay attention because it might turn into a major top. Now, he's saying there's some support here and there. There's some good things going on. So, yeah, that's possible, but I'm just pointing out the fact that it might bow tie soon. So, yeah, use whatever you use, but just... I want to show you something that I'm using that could be saying it could be a trouble, okay?
Well, the 20, 50, and 200 averages in that order. Okay. Okay, your NG, NG seems to be one of the few gold stocks where price is above the 20, 50, and 200 day moving averages. Let's put in the 50 uh, and see. And then let's put in a 200. I'm not a huge fan of the 200 day moving average. I know it's well watched and watched, but. Um, you know, you got to realize that this is almost a year's worth of trading in this average, okay? So I wouldn't get too excited about that. This is the uh, this is the 200 here. So his point is that it's one of the few gold stocks that's above all these averages. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I used to play with moving averages quite a bit. Quite a bit. That's how I ended up with the uh, the 10, the 20, and the 30. I stopped short of. Uh, Mr. Guppy, who uses about a hundred of them. <laughs> okay, so after a new high, we get a bow tie on the correction. So what do you do? Well, it depends on what the market does next. Okay, so and then I would prefer to trade individual stocks versus the overall market. So don't necessarily run out and short the S and P's because it's going to be a choppy ride, a big rally like today does not surprise me, even if the market's still in trouble. But anytime you get some sort of transitional pattern, whatever it may be, then you look to enter below the market. So at least you know that trend has resumed for that point you got in. And then, of course, you put in a stop just in case. We're looking at a stock now, and we're going to have a stop that's almost right here at this prior high because we know if it triggers, it goes back up and hits that prior high, then we're wrong on the trade and we have to get out. Uh, by the way, sometimes at a pullback, you're never really sure because sometimes it takes off, pulls back, and then makes the next leg out, of course, after stopping you out. But with the transitional setup, sometimes if it's not that far away from the prior highs, then you use the prior highs as a stop-out point, okay? H-U-S-A for Mr. Phil. Okay. Um Kind of a thin stock, uh, certainly a penny stock if you look at the price on it. And if you multiply price times volume, very thin. I think I would pass on that one. Uh, you got a huge gap down. It's just all over the place, longer term. And it's kind of hard to see, but you will have some bad memories back here. I would avoid that. It's just it's just too speculative. Okay, the Guppy down under. Yeah, yeah, that was the joke a while back, Howard. Um, we were um, I was following Guppy in a speech. And... Uh, I, I said, yeah, I use these three moving averages. I said I was going to use more, but Guppy used them all up, and he was sitting in the audience at the time. Yeah, it's funny. Wherever I go, there's Guppy. I, I go to I go to Australia. There's Guppy. He's from uh, Australia. I go to uh, Italy. There's Guppy. He gets around. He's a super nice guy, by the way. KKD. Oh my God, Krispy Kreme. You ever go to a Krispy Kreme donuts? It's like a religious experience. I think I say this all the time. They have like this donuts that just come, and it's like this glaze that just like falls from the sky, and the donuts like, ah, they could bathe in that glaze. Oh, it's just amazing. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with this stock. I love the Krispy Kremes. Um, and I hate the stock because... A lot of times it's looked like it, it's made tops and then just followed through and hasn't followed through. The problem with something like this is when you make these big obvious tops like this, it's hard to trade them afterwards. If you're in like a GME, okay, which when it first made its top back here, I saw the signals, I saw the bow tie, I saw the first thrust, I looked at the fact that it had its uh this prior top in here had lost steam, okay, and that's why I liked it. And then it took it took a while for it to finally top out, and then bam, okay, it it's obvious that now the top is in place on this one, okay, and we're short this one. Um, but now it's too late to go after a short in a stock like this because it's it's obvious that it's topped, okay. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to hold on to it, but it's obvious that it's top. So I wouldn't come in and short KKD. And it is a little wide and loose longer term because you had this big obvious gap down here. Okay.
The Mountain Dew are starting to look like cardiologists now. <laughs> well, my Mountain Dew is my Mountain Dew is diet, and I have been I have been keeping an eye on the carbs to some extent. Okay. <laughs> I threw you that bone. Hope it has some meat on it. All right, you lost me, but you got to realize, but these these um, questions are all jumbled, so I'm not sure who's saying what. Hey, Don's here. What does he want to know about? F, that's F in stock. Well, Don, it looks like it's back in trouble. It crawled up to this overhead resistance, and now it's rolled back over. Uh, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. It look, I wouldn't short it, but I certainly wouldn't buy it. It looks like it's in trouble because it did, as you can see, it got into this prior resistance and it sold right back off. It hit, it stalled out right where it should. Yeah, I mean, if anything, short it, but I don't think it's set up. Short Impel, let's take a look at that for Mr. Matt. Um, pal. Yeah, uh, in fact, I should have I should have checked my list. That's on my Landry list. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That looks pretty good. Absolutely. Gale was on our list for quite a while, but it didn't uh, didn't pan out. My apologies, to my client. Sometimes I on, uh, in a in a hurry, I, I forget which which uh, what we're going after. Um, Gale looks like it's in trouble. Um, I don't know how hard it is going to be to borrow. I tend to, I like to generally short stocks that are higher in price. Um, it looks like it's in trouble. I think I'd leave it alone, though. Uh, but if anything, yeah, it looks like a possible short. I wouldn't fight biotech just yet, overall at least, JBLU. Now, keep in mind, that's a developing situation. That could change really quick in here. And we could see some biotech setting up really soon, but right now, just a little too early on those guys. Uh, especially with, with the, you know, take a look at the IBB. You know, biotech's going back to new highs in here. So now that might be the last gasp. I don't know, but for now, I think it's a little too early. Okay, JetBlue. Um, I hear, I hear you. It broke down, but it also came back up. Let's just draw out. Let's just uh, err on the side of the trend there, and the trend is still sideways. Where is it now? Where was it three months ago? Nine. Okay, let's avoid that on both sides. Okay. Would you ever put a short limit entry at the bowtie cross over level and get in there in anticipation of trend resumption down? I find it a good turning point. Well, I agree with you, uh, Matt, on that, and I think it is a good turning point, but it doesn't always materialize. Obviously, nothing always works, but the fact that uh, it sort of goes against my my mantra of waiting for the entry. So just because you have that trend change signal doesn't necessarily mean the trend has changed, at least until you get an entry. So I think I would I I think I would avoid doing that. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to uh, to do that. Okay. Today S S P Y has a bow tie for Miss Carol. Hey Carol. Uh, you, let's see what we got. It's going to be close. Yeah, it looks like a bow tie. Let's see. Oops. Anyone speak? Check. I have a question. Hey, look. Isn't that ironic? Blue. I just pointed my screen. I'm stupid. <laughs> Blue bow tie down at the bottom is a uh, talking in chat. I wonder if he's a fan of bow ties. Let's see, the 10 is at 21, which is less than the 20, which is at 35, which is less than the 30. Yes, provided that, uh, let's see where the market closes. Now keep in mind that, that you, you, you only get a signal after the close. But yeah, based on where they are now, it sure looks like you're going to have an official bow tie. In the spiral. Now your entry would be right below this low. I'm not going to rush out and short the overall market at that low, but that would be your entry for the signal. And if you did get that entry on that signal, then you might want to think about what stocks you really want to buy at that juncture. Goal maybe, okay, because that could trade contrary to the market and it's making a major bottom. It looks pretty good. Some of these other stocks, eh, not so much. You might want to be careful in those biotechs, which are kind of priced for perfection. Okay. SCTY is along. That looks okay. Um, 
I saw it. Uh, the reason I didn't go after it, as a neutral, as you know, uh, those of you in the service, this is one we went after a few times last year, and with discretion, it had a, had a run from there to there, which was pretty freaking awesome, if I uh, if I say so myself. Uh, I don't like the fact that it just barely got past this prior peak in here before coming back down, but it certainly looks okay. If you're already long, stay long. Uh, for me to get excited again, it would have to break out to new highs and then look to play a pullback somewhere along the way. Okay, I mean, ideally, in a in a sector like solar, you want to find something that's a, that's not so mature uh, as it is now. Like back here when it was a new issue, that was absolutely beautiful as a setup back in 2013. I'm sure my peeps remember that. Um, XLS. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to have to just speed it up real quick. Um, it looks okay. My problem with this one is, notice you had a base breakout, and it pulled all the way back to the base. Watch, if you go to my website, there is an intro to the stock selection webinar where I did give away a few things, okay? Uh, go here to these videos and watch the, uh, in fact, that's for anybody who who's wants to know how to pick stocks. Go in and watch uh, these weekend charts and go in and watch this um, introduction video right here to the stock selection webinar. And I talk a lot about what happens when it pulls back to the prior base. You'll see this pattern drawn out in there, okay? IAG bounce up did pull back. Let's see, Howard. IAG. Uh, yeah, it's kind of pull back too much in here. You kind of would want to. There's, there's a lot of other goals that are better than that. Um, I hear you. It might be bottoming. But it really didn't get that far. It kind of broke out, and then it came all the way back out, back down to where it broke out from. So I think you can find better in uh, gold. You are the man. You're welcome, Howard. ITW below 78 as a short. Let's take a look at that real quick. We'll start wrapping things up in just one second. Yeah, that that's possible. This one did come up. It's on my radar. It, it is very low in HV, meaning that the stock doesn't move around much. That's my only problem uh, with it, and that's probably why it's not a setup today in the service. It also has a lot of support along the way, on the way down. Uh, yes or no, I'd say yes, but there's a few things I personally don't like about it. Obviously, you're asking my opinion, so that's why I don't think it's worth going after. But, yes, I do think it's a stock that's in trouble. Uh, it might be a good problem to have, but it looks like your ride there is only going to be down to the mid-70s and then, or the low-70s, I should say. And then it's going to consolidate around all that prior trading. I just don't think it's worth going after. I hear you, though. FNV. Okay. FNV. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. With the gold stocks, you want the golds that are down at these low levels that are just coming off and pulling back, uh, as opposed to something that's kind of wide and loose like this. I think you can do better in the golds. Just keep looking. Okay. All right, uh, I promise I get to this one last question, so let me do it. Okay, uh, back in September, I took a position at IRE on a pullback trend resumption. However, on Monday, I sold it and hit my trailing stop, which I had widened at the time. I would have needed a 20% stop to stay in. Would you say now good reddits and ignore this stock? I got to tell you, I, I hate this stock. Every time I try to trade it, I get my buttocks handed to me. Uh, so, yeah, I would say good riddance. I mean, look at this. You know, it broke out, and then it came all the way back into almost its breakout levels since prior, not too far above its prior little base in here. It's just a tough stock to trade. Um, I hate it, absolutely hate it. And every time I ignore it, like back here, I think we said, ah, oh, too many days of the pullback. It, it did it doubles over the next five days or, or two weeks, whatever. So, yeah, say good riddance. If you made money on this one, congratulations. I want to come shake your hand. <laughs> I certainly can't ever make money on this one. Well, look, we got a few unanswered questions. My apologies for not getting to everyone, uh, but uh, bring them next week. And if anything uh, you need to answer between now and then, shoot me an email, and I'll try to answer them between now and uh, next week. Uh, and if worst case, again, we'll cover it next week. Thank you, thanks to everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time to be here. I'm humbled by your presence, obviously, and uh, I have a blast on these shows. If you can't tell, I'm having a blast over here. So thanks for coming. Without you, there isn't a show. So thanks again, and then I guess uh, we'll talk again next week, if not sooner. Thank you so much.